Greetings to everyone. Nice to see you again and some new faces as well. Last time I finished on the idea that the mechanics of the genocide of the Armenians was rather varied, although in general also much common denominator throughout. A paper here that was written way back when, in 1915, under the heading of Methods of Slaughter. These were of various kinds. An officer told me that in the Vilayet, remember that was the name for province, the authorities collected the Armenians in barns full of straw or chaff, piling up straw in front of the door and setting it on fire so that the Armenians inside perished in the smoke. He said sometimes hundreds were put together in one barn. Other methods of killing were used also. He told me, to my deep sorrow, how he had seen a girl hold her own lover in her embrace and so enter the barn to meet her death without a tremor. A part were killed in straw barns with the greater number by shooting or stabbing with knives. The government hiring butchers who received a Turkish pound each day as wages. That was like a little over four dollars. A doctor named Aziz Bey, Mr. Aziz as it were, told me that when he was in Marzifun in the Vilayet or province of Sivas, he heard that a caravan of Armenians was being sent to execution. He went to the Kamakam, who's the sub-governor, and said to him, you know I'm a doctor and there's no difference between doctors and butchers as doctors are mostly occupied in cutting up mankind. And as the duties of a Kamakam at this time are also like our own, cutting up human bodies, I beg you to let me see this surgical operation myself. Permission was given and the doctor went. He had four butchers, each with a long knife, the gendarmes, they used the French term then, there was a little bit of French influence in Turkey in the Ottoman Empire, the gendarmes, or gendarmes divided the Armenians into parties of ten, ten and sent them up to the butchers one by one. The butcher told the Armenian to stretch out his neck. He did so and was slaughtered like a sheep. The doctor was amazed at their steadfastness in presence of death, not saying a word or showing any sign of fear. The gendarmes used also to bind the women and children and throw them down from a lofty eminence so that they reached the ground shattered to pieces. And on and on and on. As I said, the <coughs> blue book that was put out by the British contained huge numbers of testimonies. They weren't signed again, recall. But the bottom line is, is that the mass deportation into areas that were deliberately selected as being inhospitable was the order of the day. Men were nominally drafted, disarmed, if they had arms, most didn't, taken off to be done in, usually at night, but not inevitably. The rest of the family would be deported, exiled, if you will, nominally relocated according to the mentality of the Turks, the Turkish government of the time. But when you go into the map and look at where the deportations took place, we're in the deserts of Syria. So deprivations of all sorts, in addition to being massacred or killed along the way, or died of starvation or thirst, kidnapped, abducted, etc., the moving caravans dwindled and subsided in terms of numbers. Now, many people who choose to espouse the Turkish point of view say, well, you know, you're calling it a genocide. It wasn't, there was no mass deportation. Two big centers of population weren't even involved. Constantinople, well, we've already told you about the intellectuals of Constantinople being collected and deported. About 20 to 30,000 Armenians out of maybe 150,000 
in Constantinople were deported. Many weren't. It was not kind of a thing to do if you've got all these foreigners watching. Smyrna, the other great city on the coast, largely Greek, but quite a few Armenians and Jews as well, that city wasn't touched. But the reason for not being touched was that the German general in charge said, look, it will interfere with our operations, and by no means are you going to clutter up the roadways with Armenians being deported. So he basically saved the population of Smyrna, modern-day Izmir, but we'll see later that the population that was Christian in Smyrna was ultimately done in anyways in 1922. So just a little bit putting things off, as it were. Now, the question comes up time and time again, well, why did this happen? Well, I told you a little bit about one excuse was that we've got to get these Armenians out of the way because they are a potential source of trouble, a fifth column that will work against us. It was not a terribly good argument, but you know, as they say, anything goes when you're trying to excuse yourself from having done something pretty bad. In a problem from hell, written by Samantha Power, this is a paperback edition, the, the hardbound copy is worth a read as well. She's on the faculty at Harvard. And there's a very substantial chapter given to the Armenian genocide. There's no doubt about it in her mind that there was a, a genocide there. Robert Fisk, who's a very scholarly writer and a journalist for The Independent in London, based in Beirut, has a big chapter on the Armenian Genocide, the first Holocaust. Well, the use of the word Holocaust, which has now been pretty much uh, taken over by the uh, Jews, as it were, who would talk about the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews, in the 1890s, during the Hamidian massacres, in the New York newspapers, they were reporting the holocausts against the Armenians. So the word holocaust had been around for a long time. And there are many Jews who don't like the word holocaust either because it's tied in with sort of a Greek mentality of holocaust as a sacrifice, smoke. Well, the gas chambers were in fact uh, a little bit of smoke, but the cremations, the crematories, were another matter. The literature on all of this tends to be overwhelming, but there's lots. And one point I wouldn't mind making is the fact that in the beginning, soon after things were occurring, reports on the events weren't watered down. They're very blunt and direct. Here's a physician. The sent to the Levant. Now, the Levant is a word that some of you have heard, Levantines. The coast of Syria and Lebanon, that area where Tripoli is, that's referred to as the Levant. Levantine types, you can argue who they are, but they're a mixed bag, usually with a healthy dose of European in them. By the Near East Relief, who we've told you a little bit about and who I'll tell you a bit more about, to alleviate the suffering of victims of Turkish massacres and destruction. Now, that's pretty short and sweet, isn't it? No mealy mouth obfuscation there. Very clear cut. Now, getting back for a moment on the why were the Armenians uh, done in, as I put it. Well, some scholars have said, look, they pushed the envelope a little bit too far. They were looking for tremendous reforms in a system that was not able to reform. You know, you're wanting blood from a stone. You've got a culture that demands superiority. You're inferior, and the minute you start becoming a little bit comeuppity, well, who do you think you are? Some have suggested that things gradually went that way, it got out of hand, and the real experts say, look, 
No way. It was planned. It was premeditated. And as a result of that, you can agree with Raphael Lemkin that it was absolutely a genocide. That's one of the requirements. You have to plan it. It's got to be deliberate. It can't just happen. Massacres can just happen. Now, a lot has been written, as I said, and I've dragged in all these books, not because I want to impress you, but to point out to you that these aren't just hearsay, so-called impressions. This is just the tip of the iceberg. There are thousands of books written in the literature that goes with them, in other words, the primary literature, the historiography of genocide. And I want to use a phrase here used by a fellow who's a professor of Armenian studies at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, who said years ago when he was still a young postdoc, he said, look, the Armenian genocide is not a historiographic problem. It is a political problem. It's a political problem. We mentioned that there are those who would put fair amount of blame on the Germans. After all, the Germans were bankrolling the Turks during World War I. They had a lot of influence, and they could have, many say, stopped it all dead in its tracks if they'd just spoken out. Well, they did everything possible not to speak out because they said, we have no right to interfere in the affairs, the internal affairs of our ally, and besides, we want to keep them on our side. And we also mentioned at Gallipoli how the bad decision of people like Winston Churchill caused the complete debacle. The idea is that the British would move in with their Australian and New Zealand troops and just snuff out the Turks right then and there. Had that happened, the genocide wouldn't have proceeded. Remember, this is still in April. If they'd gone a little bit longer, the Turks would have run out of ammunition. But that wasn't the case. Turks got a second wind, and the genocide proceeded. And the idea is that the Sultan Mehmed V, who I've said was kind of a weak character, the idea was that he didn't even know the genocide was going on. The young Turk leaders, Enver Pasha, Talat Pasha, Jemal Pasha, they weren't involved. Well, they were involved. They planned it all, they pushed it, and they had a lot of henchmen. Some of them were pretty severe in their outlook. Now, I want to throw in another dimension here. You mention why would there be a genocide? Well, none of the arguments that hold for the racial theories during the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews and the Gypsies and the other Slavs, the Poles, the Christian Poles, not just the Jewish Poles, and the Slav, Russian, Bolshevists, etc. These were inferior people. And the idea was they didn't want to have miscegenation. The laws were put in place, no miscegenation with Jews. They went into a lot of intricate detail on who qualified to be collected for, quote, deportation, which is the term I said had been used even with the Jews, not just the Armenians. It was sort of you shift them and you deport them, but where do you deport them to? Well, there was one thought early on to ship them off to Madagascar or Uganda. They didn't want to go, and therefore you know what happened. At least that's one part that's been sold. But the Germans, getting back to them for one moment, got the high mucky mucks amongst the Muslims to declare a jihad. Now you've heard the word jihad in all this stuff that's going on now. A holy war. Well, the funny thing is that here you have a Christian nation, nominally Christian German nation, Imperial Germany under Kaiser Wilhelm II, claiming that he wants the Muslims to declare a holy war against all other Christians except him. <laughs> now, it's quite amusing. In fact, if you really kind of pop outside your body and look at it, it it's funny. It's ludicrous. So getting back to this business of why, none of the racial theories that obtained with Hitler took sway with the Armenians. In fact, kidnapping, 
taking Armenian women, grabbing little Armenians who weren't even sure who they were and raising them as Muslims, marrying Armenian women and girls off as Turks. They wanted, contrary to not wanting, they wanted fresh blood because they've always had a bit of appreciation for the Armenians in terms of their industriousness and their so-called intelligence and what all. Whether that's all true, God only knows. But the fact is that it wasn't because there was this horrible hatred of the race. There were a few, of course. Some said that he wished he could kill them all and resurrect them again so he could kill them yet again. Some of these people, incidentally, had their origins in Turkey, in Europe. Remember the provinces that were lost by Sultan Hamid starting in 1878? Some of these people were the offspring of victimized people. The Christians started chucking out the Muslims. And you've seen this even as recently as in Bosnia-Herzegovina, which was, in fact, a Muslim province in Yugoslavia, and now what's referred to as former Yugoslavia. So you see all of this. Some of these people are just getting even. So it's a complicated thing, but one thing is clear. They did not want the Armenians to become anywhere near independent and superior. And the sad fact part is that as Tenor Akjam's book, one of his books is called a shameful act is that many of the Turkish sultans used to refer to the Armenian milat, milat the Armenian nation under their patriarch, is the most faithful of the minorities in the empire, other than the Muslims. They were called the Sadika, the, the, the faithful people, because they cause the least trouble. And there you have it. Now, the business of describing what was going on took place in 1915. A lot of word got out. The consuls were sending telegrams, some of them coded, others not, to Constantinople to the American embassy, and we'll see a little bit more. There's a series of articles written by Henry Morgenthau. Henry Morgenthau was Jewish from New York City, had German roots. They were rather early immigrants to America. And his son, Henry Morgenthau Jr., was in fact one of the big shots in the Roosevelt administration during World War II. Now, there was in fact a attempt on the part of the people who won World War I to bring to justice some of the criminals associated with the Armenian genocide. Trials were held. They've recently appeared in translation, both in English and in Turkish, modern Turkish, from the government of Turkey official Gazette, as it were, very few copies that are available. It turned out there was a full set at the Armenian Patriarchate that I mentioned the other day in Jerusalem. There's hardly a copy of it outside of that area of the world. There must be copies in Turkey, but they're not freely separating. But these have been entitled in English, The Judgment at Istanbul. Well, you know, you can say, here I go again, but it's attempting to draw an analogy of judgment at Nuremberg. It was nowhere near as sophisticated, but they did, in fact, sentence some people in absentia and others who were much lesser officials. And the bottom line is that it went nowhere, and I'll pick up on that a little bit later. Now. The key that I want to make is this. The diasporan communities, which went all over the world, have been really the leaders in pushing 
for genocide recognition. Now you can say, well, why? Well, some have even suggested that one would like to have some closure by having said, look, we did your ancestors in, we're sorry. Some others want more, they want financial recompense, because the modern Turkey was built on the ashes and fortunes of the Christian communities that were unseated. Now, each of the provinces have been the subject of, of works in Armenian, and then more recently, they've attempted one or two generations later to get into some detail on all of this. It's, it's an interesting thing. You can feel as you read this that there is a bit of a lost connection. People would like to know what happened. I never had a grandmother. And there were <clears throat> two Armenian women in Worcester who were grandmothers, and they were considered oddities in a way that <clears throat> they had survived and their children had survived, at least some of them. Whereas everyone else of the grandmother generation, they had died or been done in. And so they became, we used to call one of them granny. She wasn't our granny. But the fact was that you looked at her and there was always this look in her eye that even as a kid I recognized was something special or different. The only time I ever saw another set of eyes like that was there was a professor of math when I first came here to Stony Brook named Peter Seuss. His mother had been at uh, Belzen in the concentration camp there. She had the same kind of eyes, the eyes that reflect the horror of what she had gone through. Now, that you can get emotional, and that's not what we're all about here, but people have written articles prosecuting crimes against humanity, the lessons of World War I. Well, as long as people choose to talk and no one chooses to do anything, there's not going to be any end to it. One of the great Jewish scholars whose parents were Holocaust survivors has said there's like a Holocaust industry. I can say there's like a genocide industry. Books are published, journals are published, and on and on and on and on and on and on. Everyone, as I put it, it's like uh, Mark Twain. They, everyone talks about the weather, but no one does anything about it. In this case, you can see everyone talks about genocide, no one does anything about it, because they can't agree. And the whole purpose of any of this is to prevent it. There's one journal called Genocide Studies and Prevention. Well, we're pretty weak on the prevention part because it happens and goes on. Queen's counselor Jeffrey Robinson, an Englishman, wrote a very nice paper who I've cited in the handout. It's online. Was there an Armenian genocide? Now, I don't like the title here either because I was taught 100 years ago by pretty good teachers that when you ask a question, the answer is usually no. Well, in this case, he concludes yes. So I would have given it a different title. But people don't like simple declarative titles, apparently. That's his attempt, apparently, to be a little bit more easygoing. The Jews who went through horrendous things and suffered genocide at the hand, they have been very wishy-washy about the Armenians. They weren't in the beginning, by the way, when it was all happening, they knew what was happening and they even participated in trying to work against the Turks in Palestine area. The Neely spy network about whom I don't have time to talk, but there's some of the, the Aronsons did a lot of good. One of the younger sisters killed herself rather than submit to what the Turks were up to. Here's a book written by Yaya Oron, who is in fact an Israeli, The Banality of Indifference, Zionism and the Armenian Genocide. He points out here in no uncertain terms that there was a genocide. People knew about it. The literature is extensive. I have here 
somewhere in this pile of whatever, that the documents of the, many documents of course, but the point is the documents before the final solution. Let me read this to you. The news coming from Germany and all the territories under German rule or occupation are most distressing. In Poland, many Jews have been killed by the German troops. I need not give you a detailed description of the horrors connected with the invasion of Poland by the Germans and the treatment meted out especially to the Jewish population, but not only the Jewish population. I'm afraid we shall have to face the fact that under German rule, two million Jews will be annihilated if not lose in, a, in not less a cruel way, perhaps even more cruel, than the million Armenians have been destroyed by the Turks during the last war. That's just an example of a document that is, is in these extensive uh, archives of the Nazi Holocaust against the Jews. Now, let's take a moment and look at a few things in terms of slides. And some of these are cartoons. And cartoons have been described, and I fully appreciate the statement, they are editorials at a glance. So here you have a quickie cartoon. You look at it. And the old statement that a picture is worth a thousand words or a million words or whatever. If you go back one, Jean, can you go back one? Okay. This is a Dutch cartoon by a, a very excellent cartoonist. And here you have the Turkish Ministry of Denial of the Armenian Genocide by Turkey in 1915. Foreign Pressure Office, Adulteration of History Department, Censorship Office, Intimidation Department, Put to Silence Department. That tells you in a nutshell the mentality that's associated with denial. There was no genocide. Using every single device to deny it because people do not like what some have referred to as the G word. It's the crime of crimes, the worst crime. No one can be called a genocidist or an outfit that would commit genocide. You immediately think of someone who's a really wretched individual. You can, they don't come any worse, as it were. Now the laws, the next slide, on all of this and there, there's a slew of them. I've brought three, and if you take the trouble to lift them, they're very heavy. Genocide in international law, second edition. Human rights module, crimes against humanity, genocide, and other crimes against human rights and war crimes. You see all these things. Introduction to international criminal law and procedure. And tell you one thing, they mean well, but they don't have much clout and talks cheap, it takes money to buy whiskey. What's the mentality behind denial? We've seen that one Dutch cartoon, which is contemporary. Let's go back to the Hamidian massacres. Here are some Kurds committing atrocities against Armenia, usually pictured as some poor young maiden. Uh, <clears throat> plea. Turkish revenues, this is John Bull. You know who John Bull is. He's the caricature version of the British Empire. He's sitting there a little bit distressed. John Bull's dilemma. Well, if you say too much, you, 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 the Suez Canal, all of these things were money. Next slide. The Dutch and Germans were also in the caricature cartoon trade. Clutter Dutch, which was a German thing, the sick cow, Armenia. As I told you, they were talking frequently about the sick man, Sultan Abdul Hamid, was sick, 
and very frequently they would show the physician in charge using the, the old enema injection technique that was always used in those days. A good bowel movement was supposed to cure everything. Here's a sick cow, Armenia, being kind of bled to death and yet expected to give milk. The milch cow is on its last legs and the Europeans are there trying to do a little bit in the last minute in the Asperges. This is the sprinkling of water, as in the church, giving blessings. The next slide will be equally telling. This is a Dutch one. They put out cartoons, and this is really great, I think. This is John Bull giving classes on how to be a son of a gun <laughs> in 1901. The snake Chamberlain, not the Chamberlain from World War II. A rabbit, Edward VII, timid. A fox, Cecil Rhodes, after whom Rhodesia was named. An absolute tyrant on the African continent, made buckets of money. Here's Sultan Hamid taking lessons, and here's Uncle Sam in the back row. Here's Kaiser Wilhelm. There's the, uh, <coughs> the Emperor of Germany, sitting there kind of uh, being a little bit disappointed. And uh, this is uh, Leopold of Belgium, who did some horrible things to the, the blacks in the Belgian Congo, collecting rubber, etc. all of which qualify to be called genocide according to the, the laws that were pushed forward as a result of Raphael Lemkin. Next slide. Now, here's Morgenthau. He was a good guy. He wrote a book published out in Garden City, Long Island. And of course, the, he had some right-hand men who were important to his staff. These two happened to be Armenian. <clears throat> One of them was a trained lawyer. He depended on him heavily, brought him to America. But the reports that he sent out have been bad-mouthed by the modern Turkish governments as being propagandistic, and one fellow has even accused him, well, he didn't even write his own memoirs. Well, how many presidents do you know that write their own memoirs? So that becomes the biggest problem. They find a little nit here and then make a big deal out of it. The whole picture is this. If you go to eastern Turkey today, why aren't there any Armenians there? There may be a handful who converted to Islam, but all the others decided to leave? Yeah, mm hmm So the business of his reports, which he was really funneling routinely, and he sent word to America by cable, tell Cleveland Dodge and others to get their act together and see if we can collect money to help the remnants that are still dwindling as they move southward into these horrible deserts. The next slide. Now I mentioned to you that the Protestant missionaries had put in place during the Hamidian period a lot of machinery to process money for the missionaries to do construction and building. The Americans, like many others, had what they called special privileges in the empire. They had forced from the fairly early on what came to be called the capitulations. The word capitulation in this case doesn't mean that you have capitulated or yielded. Rather, these capitulas in Latin, meaning a chapter where you are given certain privileges. As foreigners, Americans were to be tried in American legal system courts not in the Turkish courts, which everyone knew were outrageously corrupt to begin with. This fellow here, William Pete, was a terrifically good guy. I contacted several years back the, his um, granddaughter-in-law, who is still alive out in Iowa. He ran what was called a operation from Bible House in Constantinople. And he knew the ropes really well, and he could get money and distribute it 
which was no mean thing. You know, if we need something, we go to the bank if we have any money in it, or go to the ATM and sign out some money. He had to take money from great distances and make sure that it got, he, had, he was appreciated by many people as being incredibly honest and discreet. So I just point out that it was few people like this who made all the difference in the world. Had it not been people like him, the few survivors would not have survived to begin with. And I think it's to our credit as Americans that large amounts of money, some people say, oh, it should have been more, but a fair amount of money was raised for the Armenians and other people in the Bible lands to kind of render some aid. They did to some triage. They decided that they better give the most help to the young orphans. The older people were, maybe they'd had it, maybe they were too old, but if you've got an operating room, you're going to pay attention to the kids better than someone who's 98 years old. That's what you call triage, if you don't have enough to go around. But the orphans were particularly well looked after, and that was a very delicate thing to do too, because as part of the Turkish system, the idea was to Islamize these kids and move them into the population. Next slide. Now there's a lot of cartoon work, but here is the apostles of God. God with us. Gott mit uns, that was still used during World War II, by the way. Here you have Kaiser Wilhelm, <laughs> the Austria-Hungary, Mehmed V. Here they are with the it's, it, of course, it's making fun of them. God is with us as we perpetrate these outrageous atrocities. Next slide. Now, Harper's Weekly was one of these illustrated things. The Brooklyn Eagle, by the way, which is a very, it's a newspaper that still is published. They were big on cartoons, but here. First ally, these are from a London Zeppelin raid. You know, the big dirigible Zeppelins. Second island, these are from the Armenians. So this is Kaiser Wilhelm, you see all his medals. This thing here happens to be a Turkish medal bestowed upon him by Sultan Hamid. That was a big thing to give people medals. You can buy them on eBay now for a couple hundred bucks if you're lucky. They're not worth it, they're mainly tin. Next slide. Although he, I must say that he was generous. The imagery of a Christian people being crucified, they played that to the hilt. Now the Armenians were, for the most part in that day and age, pretty religious. Blind faith, maybe. In fact, as the statement used to say, why did not the heavens go black? Some people did lose faith as all of this was happening, saying, well, how in the world can we say there's a God when we're being done in and nothing is happening that allays our problems? But here's the cross of iron. There were crucifixions, by the way, but not like that, a lot more crude. We won't need to go into that. Next slide, please. This here is the final chapter of Armenia about to be written by a cartoonist named Morris. Finish the end. Okay, all these bodies, the ravens, crows, vultures. They said the smell was so bad in some cases that the wives of the Kurdish chieftains along the way complained that the stench was too bad. And one of the Americans who insisted on going with the deported Armenians from the area of Sivas. Somehow she ma managed that no one else was given permission, but Mary Grafham, she went as far as a town called Malatya, and by the time she got there, they said, who, how can, who, what are you doing here? You've got to go back. You can't go further. Well, they had her stay there. She had to use phenol on her carbolic acid open bottle on her windowsill because as the masses went by with the bodies that were rotting and stenches had to be somehow ameliorated and that was done with phenol. Next slide. 
here's the, the German eagle. Uh, how goes it, dear ally? The turkey buzzard. Okay. The Armenian question is settled. Remember I told you last time that one talked about a question? What was the Armenian question? Even book catalogers in various libraries still use that as a cataloging device. Next slide. You can see it looks a little bit like Mehmed V with his Nas. They were very good for caricatures. Next slide. Okay, now, again, I have to jump ahead because we can't go into too much detail. This is an Armenian map with a little bit of English here. When the war was finished, the problem is that the, there was a last ditch effort to wipe out the Armenians who had been able to withdraw, some of them, from the eastern areas around Lake Van into what was to become ultimately Soviet Armenia. They moved in. Here, the, the word for Turkey, incidentally, never was Turkey. Tajikistan, which is, sounds like Tajikistan, one of the central Russian republics during the Soviet era, the last movement against the Armenians was finally thwarted by a last-ditch effort by the Armenians at the Battle of Sadrabad, which is seen <clears throat> as a crucial battle that saved the country. Just a little bit. But in that area is where the survival of the nation began. Now, if we turn the lights on, it, it, we can see here, the denial still continues. Now, we can turn off that light, thank you. The, the thing I want to emphasize is that even with the Nazi Holocaust, which is incredibly well documented, after all, it took place in civilized Europe in contrast to the boondocks of the Near East. A nasty book written by a man who's now dead, the man who invented genocide. It basically con con concludes that Lemkin was nuts. Simple as that. Very nastily written book. Dissecting the uh, uh, Holocaust, the Jewish Nazi Holocaust. If you read this without knowing anything, you will conclude, yeah, well, they got a point. I don't think that maybe there's two sides to every story. Maybe the Jews and gypsies and Slavs weren't done in. Well, genocide doesn't mean you have to kill every last person. That's not what it's about. If that's the case, they've never done it. If anything has happened, we've done it more than anybody else. So on a finishing note, if, as someone said a few years ago, Iraq, not Iraq, as I said, if Iraq had de exported baby carriages or asparagus instead of oil, the United States wouldn't have cared one whit. Simple as that. No one wants to say, oh, we don't want to talk that way. A wonderful book by Glenn Greenwald, an international lawyer and journalist, with liberty and justice for some. He's telling you that rules don't apply to everyone. I had a mentor who I respected and got along with very well. He used to say, as an old Brit British Empire advocate, rules are for the riffraff. So this is why some people get very annoyed. There's no justice for some. And it's never going to get sorted out. And I mentioned early on, Remapping the Ottoman Middle East, <clears throat> much of the mess that we see now harkens back to the Ottoman Empire and the faulty resolution of problems and questions. There's a lot of emotion evolved. This is a very excellent artist. I like this thing here. Romain Roland to the assassinated peoples there was a German version of that. Hingeschlacht and Volker into the same people that would monitor. The, we've mentioned somewhere that there's a large Armenian di diaspora, pretty big one in the United States. 
nowadays more centered in the LA area. Some of you heard of the Kardashians. Well, I don't know anything about them. They're probably an embarrassment. Some of you have heard about Cher, as in the old Sunny and Cher. Her father was Armenian. The idea of yogurt was introduced in this country by the Armenians. Colombo yogurt was introduced by the Colombian family. They dropped the IAN. These flatbreads, lavash that you use to roll up sandwiches, there's a lot of stuff in the culture that many don't even know about. Crack wheat pilafs, bullwood pilafs were brought in by the Armenians and the industries hearkened. Now, this here <clears throat> is a magazine for the Germans, Inamo, the French, have always been very active, large numbers of Armenians in France, Greece, and so on. We told you about this ravished Armenia. Some of you may know that there was a, an important figure in modern art development where you've got a man who was born in Turkish Armenia, okay, and his mother, he became quite important. He didn't keep his Armenian name very often. Arshile Gorki was one of those people like de Kooning, etc., who played a role, and they've had a number of important art exhibits. But this is one of the best ones known amongst the Armenians. That's his idea of when he was a kid with his mother. And of course she died. And he ultimately uh, committed suicide, sadly enough. He had a screwed up life that was now. One final, final thing. The Near East Relief, we told you about the story of the Near East Relief. Huge numbers of people participated in this. I've been going through some papers that we were given recently by the great grand nephew of one of the people who served over there and got murdered by bandits, a man named Lester Wright, who we call Uncle Lester, who's buried in Wisconsin. Those who served in the Near East Relief really were patriots and heroes, beneficent workers, and they gave them a medal. They deserved it. You can't believe what these people went through. And they wrote back stories that will curl your hair in terms of just one statement that I want to draw attention to is that <clears throat> mention is made of the fact that the, I can't find it easily, so in the interest of saving time, they said the largest orphanage in the world is not in New York or Chicago or any of the great cities of the world. It's in Armenia. The largest orphanage had 10,000 kids in it, some of whose pictures we showed you yesterday, that, uh, or last week or whenever it was. <clears throat> and the business of saving the nation. So the United States, through its Near East Relief, essentially saved the Armenian people in large measure from extinction. But that, that's not only that. The, the Armenians were helping themselves where they could. The Egyptian Armenians had started up a um, organization that still functions called the Armenian General Benevolent Union. They used a lot of money in that period to buy back young girls and women who had been taken into Muslim households who, and who were not going to be willingly given up. The mentality was, look, we've taken these kids in, we've fed them and clothed them, now you give us some money or else we're going to be troublesome. So they used to spend money buying kids back. <coughs> War crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, journals, we've got an article in here, Gene and I. These are all well and good, they're important, but we can't help but say 
do we make a difference? Only when people identify with each other and not say, well, why should I give a hoot about the Armenians? I'm not Armenian. It's only when you see the common denominator of humanity in that whatever happens to everyone is the equivalent of happening to us. And that's why it's important for us to realize that we're not so wonderful as a people. We have great aspirations. We've got a lot of good points, but we need improvement too. A young fellow named Nick Terse, doing his doctorate, went into the National Archives down in Maryland, talking to one of the archivists, and they were looking for post-traumatic stress disorder and the like, and came across a treasure trove of documents from American committees that had looked into the atrocities of the Vietnam War. Absolutely no doubt that these weren't just a few bad apples that caused trouble. It's institutional. And we're not bragging about it either. And neither do we brag about what we've done to the American Indians, our Native Americans, a book by Ward Churchill, and he's usually dismissed as being an alarmist. You go into the American Indian reservations in our Southwest, you're horrified at the fact that there's no electricity all over the place. So we've got a lot of work to do, and I think that the impunity angle, which I could work on for another month, is that some people are more equal than others. And it doesn't hurt to have money, but as I used to say, you can't fight City Hall, perhaps, but you can sit on the steps. So when you keep these things in front of the public, you might look like a pain in the neck, but on the other hand, you might be able to just make some progress with young people, like you students here taking this freshman seminar, can say, look, we can do something if we care. Now, I'm going to finish up on a high note. Howard Zinn was a professor at Boston University. He's dead now. He died a few years ago. An incredible man from New York. Taught for years at a small college down south, Spelman College in Atlanta. He was chucked out because he was rabble-rousing too much against the black uh, community, kind of inciting them to, not quite to riot, but he made them more aware. Ended up at Boston University. But he's written this marvelous book. He's written all kinds of great things, A People's History of the United States. Historians tend to want to write high and lofty, detached analyses. Remember I told you that's when you become a really elegant historian is when you, you're not there. Or maybe you're out to lunch, wherever. His is very different. It's from the perspective of the people. And everyone wants to emphasize that the whole business can move forward if we have grassroots movements. If things are being done by our government in our name and you don't like it, say so. Most people were very much heartened by the Occupy movement. We went down to Zucchini Park, as one of the <clears throat> scholars put it, because he couldn't remember what it was called. It sounded like Zucchini. And the bottom line is, is that that's a good sign. People care, and they can care a bit more, because if we don't care, we're not going to be around to care about anything, much less the Armenian genocide. Nobody's genocide. We're going to do ourselves in with global warming, whether we know it or not. Another thing that I want to leave you with, if you don't know about it, I've mentioned it once before. It doesn't hurt saying it once again. Amy Goodman's Democracy Now! There is, in fact, a program on the Armenian Genocide that is referred to in your list. Everything is archived, so you can go back and get it. Professor Peter Balakian from Colgate University, who is a poet and a professor of English, as well as a person who has studied the Armenian Genocide and written about it. 
is one of the people that is being interviewed in that program. And on yet one more final last note, because here on Long Island there's a reasonable Greek community. There's a volume, again, to which Jean and I have contributed to called The Genocide of the Ottoman Greeks. What happened to the Armenians happened on a slightly uh, lesser scale, but nevertheless significant scale, and real scale, and later, to the Greeks. The emptying of Asia Minor of the Christian minorities is seen to have finalized itself in 1922 with the burning of the largely Greek commercial city of Smyrna on the coast. And of course, I could again go off, but I'll just say that they picked up again with the Kurds, uh, with the Kurds, the Turks picked on the Kurds, and they picked on the Greeks again in the 50s by heavy taxes and the large outsurge of Greeks during the Cypriot problem, which still hasn't been resolved because Cyprus is still divided into the northern Turkish Republic of Cyprus and the south is south identified with Greece. So it goes on and on and on, and there's a book written, Will Genocide Ever End? We can hope that it will, but it's kind of hard to be terribly optimistic.